Hello, my name is Paul Gilbert. I'm president of the Compassionate Mind Foundation. And this is part of the Creating a Compassionate World series of interviews. And today I'm delighted and very honored to be talking to a Peter Story. Now, Peter Story, I'm going to read you his biography, is, is a very impressive character who has some amazing wisdoms and courage to share with us about what the work he did in South Africa during the transition out of apartheid. So Peter Story is a South African minister who was the uh, presiding bishop of the Methodist Church of South Africa and the president of the South African Council of Churches, working closely with the then Bishop Desmond Tutu during the struggle against apartheid. Earlier, he was chaplain to Nelson Mandela and Robert Subukwe, the other political prisoners on Robben Island and minister in Cape Town's District 6 in solidarity with the many thousands of people of color being forced from their homes. More than 50 years ago, he launched the Lifeline South African Telephone Counseling Movement, which offers its compassionate support 24 hour care in over 20 cities. In the early 1990s, he chaired the National Peace Accord structures in Johannesburg, Soweto and surrounding areas, intervening in the violence threatening South Africa's first democratic election. After liberation, he was appointed by President Mandela to meet, uh, to help select the commissioners on the nation's Truth and Reconciliation Commission that sought to confront the horrors of the apartheid era and begin the healing process between the nation's racial groups. He was part of the National Peace Accord, which he called the best kept secret of South Africa's so-called miracle transition. By chairing the Regional Peace Committee in the Johannesburg Soweto East Rand region, some 25 different bodies were formed, formed the RPC from the army, police, trade unions, all political parties, especially the apartheid regime, who were using underground methods to destabilize and terrorize black communities, the ANC and the Zulu Inkada movement, who were at war with each other on the ground, jockeying for position with a view to forthcoming negotiations with the regime. In retirement, Peter taught at Duke University at Divinity School in the United States for seven years and launched a new Methodist um, seminary in South Africa. He preached and lectured in more than 150 cities around the world and was one of the 25 international faith leaders who authored the worldwide Charter of Compassion in 2009. His memoir, Protest at Midnight, Missionary to a Nation Torn Apart, has recently released uh, with inspiring reviews. And I'm just going to read you one of those reviews. You can see his book now here on the screen. Uh, this review says this, uh, this is no ordinary memoir that one reads with taxed intellectual engagement. It is a a complacency shattering challenge to invest one's life on behalf of justice, compassion, truth telling, and radical hospitality rooted in kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God. Here is a book of profound theological insight and vision that reads like a riveting novel. It is a must read for anyone who wishes to be an agent of transformation in this dangerous world. Um, Peter, welcome to the interviews. And as you discussed, we're very interested in the courage and wisdom of compassion. And your life really exemplifies that extraordinarily, in extraordinary ways. And as I say, I'm just very privileged to be talking with you. So I wonder if I could start off by asking you, so what got you into this compassionate life is wanting to address these really tricky and difficult areas that you've been involved with? Well. Paul, thank you for the welcome, and it's good to be with you. Um, in my case, uh, I guess it's fairly obvious that uh, after starting a career in, in the Navy uh, and hoping that I would spend my life as a naval officer, that was my passion, I was kind of hijacked by uh, God into a, a new calling, and I was called into the, into, into the ministry. Uh, if you were going to be a minister in the church in South Africa at that time, 
not long after the apartheid regime came into power, um, the question had to arise as to what does it mean to claim to be a follower of Jesus in the Christian faith uh, in a country that was becoming increasingly a police state and basing its ideology on, 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 on racial superiority and on the discrimination against people of color. Uh, now I know that many people of faith manage to close their eyes to that and um, live their faith life as if it was some otherworldly thing, as if it was on another planet. But in, in, in my case and in the case of, of many others, um, including remarkable people like uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu, uh, who, who I have known for 46 years and worked with over, over those years, um, there was absolutely no choice at all. Either your faith uh, had to had bearing on the injustices right in front of your eyes, or it was meaningless. If your faith had no word to say and could not get engaged with such an obscene injustice and such a, a dreadful uh, denial of human uh, compassion and human relationship and human dignity, then your faith was absolutely useless and meaningless. And so together with, with many others, uh, we began to, to mobilize and to ask the question, just what is required of us? Um, and it seemed to me that there were, there were four priorities as a Christian minister, if you like, and as a preacher, if you like, uh, as a pastor, as somebody who is supposed to be uh, living out the things I talked about. The first was to tell the truth. The first was to expose the evil in front of us and to do so with, with, without fear um, and to do so as often and as clearly as possible in a, in a, in a country where the propaganda of the regime was, or was flooding the airwaves and uh, the, the minds and hearts of people all the time. Uh, the, the second thing was to bind up the broken, that you had no right to speak about injustice and that you were engaged somehow with the people alongside them who were suffering those injustices. Um, and uh, I was reminded of the example of Jesus who had an important job to do, which was to declare a new kind of world of justice and compassion which he called the kingdom of God. Uh, but that didn't deter him from being called aside time and again to deal with uh, a blind man, uh, somebody suffering from leprosy, a woman who was being uh, about to be stoned uh, and, and so on. And so binding up the broken was as important as speaking out against the evils. The third thing, was to try and create communities of, of true uh, oneness, communities reaching out to one another, seeking to cross the, the gulf that had been created by uh, racism in our country and the apartheid policy. And so it seemed to me to be absolutely crucial that any congregation I was going to minister to would have to face the issue of integration, coming together, discovering one another, seeing the human being in one another, seeing the image of God in one another, and if necessary, having to go through a profound transformation of maybe their, their, uh, their prejudices and the, the assumptions they had grown up with about one another. And the final of the four, principles, which it seemed to me would be important if I was going to be any use as, as a minister in South Africa, uh, was to, uh, to join the, the, the energy for change 
And that meant reaching out to people and working with people who might have very different views, might be people of faith, people of no faith. They were members of the Communist Party. There were people from other groups who had all become willing to lay their lives on the line to, to end apartheid in our country. And it seemed to me that um, my task was to join them and to be, to be one with any kind of movement for freedom in our country. Uh, those were the four principles that sort of began to distill in my own mind if I was to stay in this uh, country with its evil policies and its dreadful cruelties and try and make a difference. Yes, that's absolutely fascinating. I mean, I wonder if I could just push you a little bit because, I mean, as you rightly point out, humans have a terrible dark side. I mean, the, 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 the history of humanity is pretty bad, you know, with our Roman games and our crucifixions and, uh, you know, the Holocaust and what's going on in Ukraine. I mean, for thousands of years, humans have been very happy to do horrible things to each other. So it takes a very special kind of mind, really, to stand up against that and put themselves really in the lion's den. I mean, you make a point that your faith was really crucial to that, that finding that inner courage. But I suppose my question is many people are, are Christian, but I'm not sure they'd have the kind of courage that you had. What, what was it in you that made that such a crucial issue to put your own self on the line, really, as you did many times? Paul, well, first of all, let me simply affirm what you have said. And let me say straight away that in that long list of the horrible things people have done to one another, the Christian church is certainly not innocent. It carries, it carries a dreadful burden of guilt for the way in which it has twisted the teaching of its, of its leader, Jesus, um, and completely abused uh, what he came to do and say. Um, on the other hand, what gives me hope even about this very scarred and broken thing called the Christian church, which at the moment I think is probably as, as poorly regarded as it ever has been in history because of its failure to stand up for the things that Jesus stood up for and its determination to preserve itself rather and its concern for self-preservation of the of of, of a crumbling institution instead of the energy of love and compassion which drove Jesus. Uh, that's just a sidebar. I needed to say that. No, that's, uh, that's good. Yes, that's absolutely right. Yes. Confession is good for the soul. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it, it seems to me that when one gets to the core of, uh, of any great religion or ethical um, position, one comes to love and compassion. Um, in, in, in Jesus's case, and, and, and this is what so often challenged me, everybody knows the parable of the Good Samaritan, everybody knows about it, but if we think about it a little bit, the fact that this person was one of the despised and one of the race that was discriminated against by the very man who was lying in the gutter, not only did he, according to Jesus, have come, see him, in other words, see him with, new, with different eyes, have compassion, but he, he went to him. And then there's a list of eight things he did. He went to him, he bathed his wounds, he put him on his horse, he took him to an inn, he paid the money for the inn, he stayed overnight with a guy, he said to the innkeeper, I'm coming back. You know, compassion, therefore, is not a feeling, it's an action. And, 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 and therefore, unless we, looking on the injustices that were being suffered by our fellow South Africans just because they were born of a different color, if we were not doing something, then we were just empty barrels. And, uh, and, and, and so uh, there, there, there were those who, who, who closed their eyes. It's about seeing people in a new way. It's about having a new set of eyes 
it's 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 about seeing the yourself in the other it's about uh, it's about recognizing the 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 preciousness of the other human being it's about it's about empathizing it seems to me to the degree that is possible and there's no way in which a white privileged south african could fully empathize with what blacks in our country were suffering but at least you could touch the edge of their pain and the only way that would happen is if you engaged and put yourself alongside and to the degree that was possible put yourself with uh, entered into the lives of those who are suffering uh, and that to me was simply the message of the faith that i was supposed to be proclaiming um, because that to me is 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 what jesus did um, but i don't i don't want at any time to suggest that compassion is only possible amongst people of faith because it isn't some of the great heroes that we worked with and met in the peace accord uh, process on the ground for instance uh, some of the great heroes that we met later uh, in in the amazing truth and reconciliation commission process these were not necessarily people of faith at all the people who had discovered the core of what being a human being means being human means i mean i think you put that so beautifully because you know people think that you know compassion is a bit of kindness or whatever and stuff like that but the key that you're highlighting time and again is this issue about the sensitivity to the pain of the other to the preparedness to move towards rather than away the preparedness to engage rather than dissociate deny or can't be bothered uh, but also this issue that you highlight the point of then taking action Okay, yes. that ability to take action and that action may cost you it may put you in danger or it may cost you financially or whatever i mean the story you gave of the good samaritan is an example that we put ourselves out for the benefit of the other so i think it's a brilliant way in which you put that from a christian point of view that actually at the heart of compassion is this deep sensitivity to the suffering of the other with a real commitment to work out uh, how you can help and what you can do. So, I mean, I think it's wonderful how you got to that position, which, you know, we who study it, now think about it as what we call it an algorithm, the sensitivity plus a response, A and B. Uh, I think it's wonderful how you got to that through through your, your faith. So that's your faith triggered in you this deep motivational system for caring and compassion. And that's sort of put you through so can you tell us a little bit about how that helped you in the more darker times when you must have been really quite anxious and concerned about uh, how things were going for you well i i i i for instance in the in the peace accord structures where we found ourselves um my, my son david you know was one of yeah. many of uh, many who who who, who worked on the ground in very, very tense and, and fraught circumstances. I had some of those experiences as well. Uh, I remember one where uh, there, there was a, a black township where the members of Ankata, a Zulu political organization who were at war with, with people who, who sympathized with the ANC, Usually in Carter members were migrant laborers living in hostels under dreadful conditions. Uh, but these men were mobilized for political purposes and manipulated by a man called Butelezi, their leader. Um, and uh, and they, they, they broke out of their hostel one day and just marauded through this township, killing and, 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 and wounding and, and cutting and, and chopping people up. It was a horrible event. And I remember that Desmond Tutu and Frank Shikani and myself and a few others drove into that township the next day while people were still just where bodies were being cleared up and so on. And people were angry. They were shouting at us through the window of the car, give us guns, give us guns. Don't come and talk to us about peace. But, and it, it, was, it was a very painful moment. 
And um, a few days later was Sunday, and I felt very strongly that something needed to happen on that Sunday. I called my clergy and I said, would you join me? And we're going back into that township. And uh, we're going to a church and we're going to hold, we're going to invite the people who have been hurt and broken. And, and, and so we had this, uh, a number of my clergy, this is where it always happened. Some of my clergy came, the rest had, had other things to do all of a sudden. But we had this amazing service where many women who had lost loved ones in this horror it, it came to the service. And, and these mothers particularly came forward and people gathered around them, prayed with them and sought to, to just bring some comfort to them. Uh, very, very powerful moments. But then I had to preach. And uh, what do you say on an occasion like that? I mean, what do you say? So, but something came to me during that sermon. Uh, I suddenly said, you know, these people who did this to us, have you ever been into one of their hostels? I have. Have you seen the way they live? Nine months of the year away from their loved ones. What a twisted kind of life. And then when somebody comes and tells them that they will find, um, they, they will gain a legacy by going out and, and making war, and killing people. Uh, what is it like? What if you were the mother of one of them? Uh, I don't know what it was that took me in this rather dangerous direction. But I found a, a remarkable response. I found that there was a kind of, there was some kind of affirmation coming out of the, 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 the crowd. And some of the very mothers who had lost loved ones were saying yes. So then I took a chance and I said, well, I think we, we should go to them. Uh, and uh, and I, 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 I'm going to walk now to that hostel. And if you want to come, come with me. An amazing number of people joined me. And we walked towards a hostel, which was armed, which was barricaded, where there were guys with guns looking out of windows, broke, broken windows and gun barrels. It was very scary. <laughs> so <laughs> we decided we'd sing some hymns uh, to try and sort of disarm the situation, and, and, and we did. And fortunately, the, the Methodist Church, black members, women members of the Methodist Church wear scarlet tunics and white hats. It's a, a kind of uniform of the women's movement. So, you know, there was this remarkable sort of march, uh, clearly identified as church people. And we got to the gates, you know, these were barricaded compounds, these hostels. And the, the gate opened for us and we went in. But when you're in, you're surrounded by the hostels on every side and you're in a courtyard, you are trapped. And there were men on the roof and they were armed. And it was, it was, it was scary, but uh, some of the, the more senior Zulu and Dunas and so on gathered around and I began to speak to them and to tell them why we'd come the terrible things that happen in the week. It may be they themselves had done terrible things, but we also were aware of, of the terrible things the system had done to them uh, over the years and the way they had to live, and, and the horrible conditions they lived in and so on. And fortunately, uh, I had an interpreter who interpreted into Zulu and that, that meant everything I said was said twice. And there was, there was time for people to begin to absorb what was happening. And after a while, you know, the weapons came down to their sides and you could feel something happening. And essentially, I think all we were doing was saying that for years, your humanity has been disregarded and trampled on. And, and we want to come and say, we believe you're human in spite of what you've done. 
and that there's a chance maybe of some newness coming. Um, now, I can't explain um, why we got away um, unhurt and uninjured and with a with with the thanks of of, of these these men ringing in our ears, and I can't I'm not suggesting that you know all sorts of lovely things happened after that. I'm just saying it was a moment in which compassion ruled and had the power to disarm people, and also had the power to to bring out of very hurt and wounded people. Uh, an awareness of the humanity in the very people who had done this to them. Uh, I'm sorry to spend so much time on the story, but it just seems to me that, that uh, that's what gives you hope. You asked what gives you hope. Um, Desmond Tutu was very impudent in those days, and he used to stand up in the worst and darkest moments, and he used to say to the regime, Look, why don't you join us before it's too late? Join the winning side. And he wasn't talking in military terms. He was talking about the fact that those who stand for human dignity, for compassion, for reaching out to one another and togetherness um, will always be on the winning side ultimately. Because that what's, that's what really wins in, in, in human beings, ultimately. We've got to decide whether the dark side or that beautiful part of what it means to be human is where the weight lies. And uh, there are many of us foolish enough to think that it lies with human goodness. No, that's wonderful, isn't it? <clears throat> that's, a, that's a really wonderful thing i think the point about it is is that we you know people often talk about compassion for you know flourishing and happiness but this is compassion for the dark side compassion for the dark side because as you say you know hurt people hurt people right and you find usually what's behind a lot of violence and hatred is wounds and if you can speak to those wounds and not shame and and blame that gives you an opportunity for connectedness to what is wounded in them so, you know, the way that you talk is really such an inspiring um, way of thinking about how do we address the dark side? Uh, because rather than shooting it, locking it up and punishing it and trying to, you know, poison it out of existence, it has to be embraced somehow. And that the capacity to compassionately embrace the dark side. But, you know, I come back again to the fact that that was an incredibly courageous thing to be doing, addressing the stupid, dark side. Very stupid. <laughs> I'm not sure when. <laughs> but you know, many inspired moments do look stupid, and yet they they have the potential to break through something which has seemed to be unbreakable. I remember a young black uh, member of um, of uh, the ANC who we trained as a peace monitor. And I remember a situation, I was not there, a situation when um, the armed police were confronted by a, a very large number of, the, of, of demonstrators armed with various sticks and spears and things. And, uh, and the police were obviously in trouble with this. They didn't know what to do. And, and the officer gave them the order to load and, uh, in other words, to prepare to fire. And this guy walked up to the officer and said, give me one chance, just one chance. I know these people. I know these people. And he actually walked into the sort of no man's land with the police's guns, if you like, on his back and then spoke with these people. And he diffused the situation. But what it was, was the, the courage to move towards them um, in what would seem to be an almost insoluble situation that was not gonna be solved without violence. Uh, 
uh, I think of another hostile dweller who was himself, um, who, who was himself a Zulu when the hostels occupied by Cosas who tended to support Mandela and the Zulus who tended to support Buddha, they had been fighting and killing one another. And he, he, he went alone to the gates of uh, the Cosa hostel. And he was met with, of course, enormous hostility. What are you doing here? And why can't, he said, before you kill me, before you kill me, just listen, just, just listen to, to two words I have to say and promise me this. The first is, if you kill me, please take my body to Zululand for burial. Let me be buried where I come from, which is a very important thing in black culture. And the second thing is, I just have a question. How many more of us have to die? Now, for a simple, illiterate man to somehow be driven by what motivation right into the jaws of death, if you like. Now, it happened that, that they said, come and talk to our leaders. And that actually gave birth to the hostile peace movement, where some months later, I stood with one of our, our, our Methodist clergy who headed up this movement and watched a soccer match between those two hostels. You know, th that, that was the ultimate fruit of one man's um, need to plead for common humanity. So I, big doors swing on little hinges in this world, uh, you know, and, and uh, <clears throat> we, we can't ever underestimate the, 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 the possible outcomes and fruits of one act of compassion. And you rightly say it often takes enormous courage because I'm, I'm, I'm often, um, I often think of the words of Walter Wink, uh, an ethicist and theologian who wrote that the only way to, the only way to God in this world is through the enemy. And what he was essentially saying is, if you want the kind of, if you want the kind, if you claim, if you like, that there is in fact a, a God who of justice and compassion and love. If, if that's your claim, then your way to that God is you're going to have to seek out enemies. Uh, anybody can seek out friends and have a happy little religious time together. Uh, that's just playing. It's seeking, it, it, it's going to the places that, the dark places, if you like, uh, and, and confronting them with something new and different. Yes, that's such an important thing because, you know, what we're saying about the dark side is we don't just say, oh, it's okay, you know, you've been hurt, blah, blah, and we just get on with it. It's actually, as you say, confronting. It's about the desire to prevent it, to prevent further suffering and so on. So that's such a, a key issue. I mean, what do you see as the challenges now to continuing this? I mean, when you look around the world, obviously, we're still haunted by the dark side. It is the greatest challenge of humanity. I mean, all the technological stuff with climate change or whatever, but this side of our personality has always been the side that's really been so destructive and held us back. So, I mean, if you was to look at those challenges, I mean, what would you say about that? I mean, how can we get our politicians to maybe be a little bit more spiritual like you, uh, which would uh, be lovely, wouldn't it? Um, well, I do think that um, you know, in the struggle against the party, we had to try and keep a balance of of denouncing and being utterly clear yeah. and uncompromising about the evil that these guys were perpetrating uh, on on our nation and on people of color, but at the same time keep some kind of door open to them. Um, and that's not an easy balance. And there were some uh, people who, for instance, when we went to confront President Buerta, um, uh, 
in his lair, you know, at the Union buildings in Pretoria, uh, the president of the country and his cabinet, uh, some said, you know, that you're selling out, you don't talk to the enemy. But in fact, if you, if you, pers if you, pers if you are convinced about the humanity, even within people who are doing the worst things, then you've got to keep some kind of line open. I remember saying to him, Mr. President, you should listen to us because we're the only people who come into this office who don't want your job. We, we're here because we, we believe in a different South Africa and we believe you, you know, you're ruining it um, and that you need to change. Uh, so it is a balancing act. I wish I had I wish I had answers. I don't. I only have convictions. <laughs> um, but you know, when when change came in our country, we set up this thing, which, in a way, the world had never seen—a truth and reconciliation commission. And whatever the mess South Africa is in today, and I'm disgusted and ashamed at what the ANC has done with our country. We did have that bright and shining moment of 15 or so years uh, led by Nelson Mandela initially, uh, where he, his own humanity was just so profoundly real uh, and his own ability to identify even with his enemies, uh, especially with his enemies, if you like, was so astounding that it made us all want to be better people. So let's not underestimate the power for good or evil. Compare a Nelson Mandela with a Donald Trump, and you've got exactly what I mean. Donald Trump has given, his behavior has given permission for all the ugly, nasty stuff to come out of the woodwork and to now boast its presence in the United States. Whereas, under Nelson Mandela, white, black, English, Africana, all began to want to be better people. We were excited about being part of a country that was doing good things with one another and to one another. And it was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which these days people like to poo poo. I think it's the most remarkable uh, piece of legislation that's ever come out of a secular parliament. You know, the minister, the new minister of justice, who himself had been tortured by the racists in his time, he said to us as, 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 as ministers and priests and rabbis and, 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 and so on, he said, look, you're the guys who have to do, do this. You've got to tell us how to do this. He says, I'm a lawyer. I believe, you know, I've been taught about crime and punishment, but you guys use words like confession and forgiveness and redemption. These are these words, he says, are the words we need now. We have got to find a way in which the guys who did the bad things can find space to be honest about it and to confess it. We've got to find a way to let the people who have been hurt tell their stories and feel that at last they are going, their lives are going to be reverenced. And so we, we, we embarked on this remarkable um, experiment. And I, I want to say that we saw in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission a microcosm of what of how humans could relate to one another, where somebody came and disclosed and talked about the things that usually it was a he had done, and it was usually a white guy, uh, horrific things. And the very people whose loved one had been tortured and assassinated and whose body had been burned on a fire while this guy had a barbecue, you know, horrible thing. They were sitting there. And at some point, what we had created was a safe space in which these forces of, of anger and hurt and 
sorrow and, and, and the rest all met together. And in many cases, something happened between those people because we'd create a space which, in which it was safe to tell the truth and to be real with one another. It didn't always happen, of course. Uh, but what I'm saying is, what would it be like? You talk about politicians. What would it be like if there were safe spaces where, where people could somehow come to grips with the things they had done to each other and find a new way forward? Um, yeah. Yes, I mean, that is profoundly important for us to kind of take responsibility for the harm that we've caused. I mean, as you know, in the West, colonialism, slavery, and you can go on and on really about the awful things. But of course, nobody really wakes up and chooses to do that. I mean, even people who are psychopathic, they don't wake up at five o'clock in the morning and think, when they're five years old, they think, I could be a surgeon, but now I was born, I'll be a psychopath. We are partly created by our circumstances, and that's what catches us in the dark side. So the point that you're making is such a key issue, is that not only do we have a common humanity in the compassion, but we also have a common humanity in our potential for doing harm, and it's recognizing that. It's not like I'm the good person, you're the bad person. It's like maybe in your situation, I might have been the bad person, and you might have been the good. You know, that ability to do that interchange in minds that you're talking about is, is such a profoundly important thing. You no, know, I think you're absolutely right. And for me, the for me, rightly or wrongly, it has always seemed that the primary motive which can drive people to do inhuman things is fear. Yes. And yes. unfortunately, our politicians are a criminal in the way in which they manipulate people's fears. Absolutely. And it it is. Uh, some politicians could not exist unless it was the fears which they and, and so it seems to me in the in the anti-gun movement which i was very much part of in in our country i kept on saying we speak for the unarmed majority against a small minority of people who are so afraid of other people that they have to have a gun. But the unarmed majority either cannot afford a gun or wouldn't want one in their house. So we're on the, we're, we're the majority. Why don't we behave that way uh, and use our power as a majority? Why don't, why don't we say to the politicians, we reject, the majority of people reject out of hand uh, your constant attempts to make us fear this one or that one because of who they are or where they were born or what color they are or what sexual orientation they have or whatever it is. We are not going to accept that. And why are not, let me say bluntly, why are not so many of the disgusting things said from pulpits challenged? And why can we not challenge elements of right-wing Christianity, for instance, which is as hateful as any other ideology, uh, if we claim to be to have that kind of heritage? Um, I remember being in a, a conference in our country, the Dutch Reformed Church officially supported the apartheid policy. These were, the Dutch Reformed Church was largely Afrikaner white people. Um, and I remember the first time I met with a group of Dutch Reformed ministers. I was not happy to be there, and I certainly didn't want to hear what they had to say, because I saw them as having betrayed the, the Christian gospel by supporting this evil ideology. And they talked, and as we talked more and more, they talked about their background, their roots and their history, and so much of it went back to the British, my heritage, and the Boer War, and the concentration camps where their women and children died because the British 
in invented the first concentration camps and pushed their women and children by the thousands into these camps to stop them supporting the Boer fight. And I, I couldn't sleep that night. And the next day I had to say to these guys, look, I don't in any way, any way condone the stuff that you've supported in, in terms of apartheid, but I do know that I carry a legacy that I have to confess. Because all night I was thinking, what would have happened in our country if after the Boer War, the Brits had confessed and accepted that they had done some terrible things through those concentration camps? What kind of Afrikaners would we have today? Would they be the people who are so bitter? Would they be the people who have this massive uh, grievance on their back? Would they be the people who would never ever want anybody else to have control of their lives again because of what the British did to them? Maybe we would have had a different country if the British had the grace to listen to some of their own people, because there's some remarkable Brits who came out and worked in those concentration camps who called on their government to, to acknowledge the wrongs that they had done. So we have the tools. We really have the tools. It's just that it's only very seldom that people seem to spend the kind of resources and time in training us to use those tools as they do to train people to use machine guns and artillery and jet planes and things. Um, we've got the tools to make a different world. I think that's such an important point, isn't it? Because you're saying it's not only addressing the dark side in the other, it's addressing the dark side in ourselves, but without blaming and shaming. Because the moment you get into blaming and shaming, people close down, they become defensive. Look, we're all caught up in this. Nobody chose this, right? Yep. We are, and we have yep. to work it out. It's been going on for thousands of years. You know, you can blame the Romans, you can blame Napoleon. I mean, you can blame Hitler, blame who you want. Yep. But in the end of the day, it's really about us recognizing what we are capable of and making the decisions for good or for bad. And I think you are just a wonderful example about how you have worked with that within your own mind and you found in the Christian faith, this real depth of understanding the, the wisdom and the courage and compassion, which is so inspiring. So we're coming to the end now. Let me just ask you one more question. <clears throat> so how do you, or how are you, or how do you perceive taking these really fundamental beliefs and values forward? I mean, how do you see the challenges from here and what would you like to see how your work progresses? Well, I think we all have a circle of influence, all of us. Some have a large circle, some have a smaller circle, but there are people who are touched by what we say and do, and, and, and especially, especially how we act towards one another. Um, that's where it starts. It, it sounds very modest, and people who want some, you know, some beautiful blueprint for massive transformation across the world are going to have to just wait. Um, it's always started that way. Any movement started that way. And I'm, I'm, I'm always touched when I hear the announcement of the Nobel Peace Prize. And sometimes a person is lifted up who lives a modest life somewhere far away where you wonder on earth how, how they could have been chosen, but then you hear about how they have lived lives of integrity, of honesty, and particularly of compassion, and have been instruments of, of reconciliation. Uh, and, and for a moment, the world looks at them and says, wow, that's the way we should all be. And then the world forgets. Uh, so it's, it's how do we, through our education, through every possible means, whether it's faith communities, whether it's whatever it is, how do we, how do we help people to see 
yes, that big doors do swing on little hinges and that their sphere of influence is either made beautiful by the way they live or is somehow darkened and, and, and made, made hard and hard edged and painful by the way they live. Um, we, you mentioned the Charter of Compassion and perhaps I could just end with this. Uh, an, a number of us uh, faith leaders were invited to Geneva to spend some time working together, uh, shaping a, a Charter of Compassion, um, which was then issued. Uh, and I, 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 I the, uh, what the impact of that was is hard to measure, but the experience of being together with people so different was very special to me and, and dealt with some of my prejudices with um, relating to perhaps other religious communities. But the most important moment was when a Rabbi Zutendorf, who is from the Netherlands, spoke. We had to tell our stories, and he told his story and why we were there. And he said, I'm here because when I was uh, a baby, my parents were taken to, by the Nazis uh, to um, a concentration camp, a death camp. And he said, when we got off the train, when they got off the train there, with me in their arms, in my mother's arms. Uh, the SS were pushing us towards the camp gates and my mother held me up. And he said, a non-Jewish woman who was one of the spectators held out her arms for me. The SS guard Stop. And then he said, he turned his back. And I'm alive. Because for a moment, a spark of compassion was lit. And he said, even if even an SS guard can have compassion, then all of us are capable of it. If only we can help people find it within themselves and express it. And so he he's alive, he says, because of compassion. And he's alive because compassion was shown by the most unlikely person at an unlikely moment. Um, so I have hope, but I think people like yourself and so many others who are helping to, if you like, put compassion at the center of what it means to be human are so important. And so I hope that your work bears enormous fruit, um, Paul. I've come to the end of my life. I'm on, on my way out, but I truly do believe that this is the key. Peter, that is a wonderful story to finish on, I think. And uh, actually, you are such an inspiring man, and I really do recommend your book, Protest at Midnight. I think it's a, it's a fantastic book. And uh, as I say, you've shown the key of compassion, the courage and wisdom to address suffering wherever it is, including the dark side. Peter, thank you for an amazing hour, and uh, we you. will be in touch again. Thank you.